Good afternoon. My name is Chaz Garcia. I'm the second vice president and the bargaining chair of the Oakland Education Association. We are here today to discuss science, trends, and guidance around safe schools in Oakland. We are very fortunate to be joined by a group of wonderful people who are going to speak to us today around the topics of science, trends, and guidance. We know that everyone has been suffering from a great deal of stress and anxiety over the past 10 months due to the pandemic. And we are very much concerned about the safety of our students and our community. And because of that, we wanted to make sure that we stay grounded and together moving forward so that we can provide the best educational experience and also provide safety for our community. Today, we are joined by Dr. Bob Harrison, a clinical professor of medicine and the associate director of the Occupational Environmental Medicine Residency Program at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Harrison also directs the National Occupational Health Internship Program and has led many work in environmental investigations of disease outbreaks. He served as a technical, and scientific consultant to federal OSHA and to the CDC's Workplace Safety Research Program, and was a member of the California Occupational Safety and Health Standards Board. We are also joined by Teresa Piscatini. She's a registered professional engineer and engineering manager at the UC Davis Energy Efficiency Institute and Western Cooling Efficiency Center. For over 10 years, she's conducted applied research in heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, including studies focused on California school buildings. Teresa co-authored a recent paper on ventilation and energy efficiency verification and repair program for school reopening. We are also very honored to have one of our amazing parents, Alexia Maciela, uh, who is a parent of a student at La Escuelita, a TK-8 school here in Oakland. Our moderator today is Laura Curry from the California Teachers Association. Laura has a master's degree in public health from the University of California, Berkeley, and previously worked in the field of occupational health and safety at both UC Berkeley and UCLA. In today's conversations, we will have the opportunity to hear from all parties and bring everyone together around the safety of our community here in Oakland. Laura. Hi, thanks Chaz. Hello everyone. I'm excited to be here with you today. I'd like to first um, talk with Dr. Harrison. Um, you know, Dr. Harrison, I'm hoping that you can help us make sense of this current moment that we are in in California. Um, just to set a little context for all of our viewers today. So Alameda County, where I live, um, is in the widespread level of transmission risk, the purple tier. And according to this week's California Department of Public Health report, our county's um, case rate was more than double what the state threshold is for getting into the purple tier. So for folks who are, you know, heard these words of purple and red and orange and yellow, for the purple tier, the state has a case rate baseline of seven daily new cases per 100,000 people on average for the, about the, the past prior week. And that's after giving a county extra credit for the volume of tests they are conducted. Um, because we don't want to discourage testing, so the state provides an adjustment on that in its tier program. So the purple threshold is at seven to get into the purple tier above seven, and our county is at 16. Last time I checked, we were at less than or less than 10 percent. I think we're down to nine percent of ICU capacity across California. And here in the Bay Area, in a recent news story, um, it was reported that even San Francisco expects to get tight in ICU beds by late December. And I, I know, Bob, you work at one of our 
our major hospitals. Um, the San Francisco Public Health Director warned that the virus is raging even through San Francisco. Um, and across our state, we've already lost 20,000 people. Those are 20,000 loved ones, family members, neighbors, friends. And we should also I think, be very clear-eyed on the reality that children and families of color and low-income families um, are facing during this pandemic. Nationally, one-third of Black Americans personally know someone who's died of COVID-19. Uh, earlier this fall, the CDC re released a report on pediatric COVID fatalities which found that 78% of the deaths were among Latinx, Black, and Indigenous children and teens. Here in Oakland, there have been a disproportionate cases in Black and Brown communities, with East Oakland being particularly hard hit. And we're seeing consistently that poor areas in our cities and our communities have been suffering the most serious health consequences of this pandemic more than wealthier neighborhoods. So the convergence of COVID, racism, and poverty can't be overlooked. So public health advocates have demanded an approach to control the virus that removes those systemic barriers and really invest in and actually achieves health equity. Um, so, you know, in this moment where we are seeing this surge, um, help us, Dr. Harrison, like understand this moment as we are in the winter holidays, what trends should we watch out for? And what do these broader community conditions mean for our schools? Thanks, Laura, very much for having me. Um, the surge is unprecedented. We're in the third wave of COVID-19. So the first wave was in the March, April timeframe, the early spring. Um, and we'll all remember that in many parts of the country, we went into a sheltered place. Um, where I live, San Francisco was one of the first to go into a shelter in place for several weeks. Uh, we flattened that curve in San Francisco and in many other parts of California. Um, I think we relaxed a little bit heading into the summer, but then post Memorial Day, when folks got together, we had a second peak. Um, we were able to flatten that, not quite as much, but now um, in the November, December timeframe, particularly after Thanksgiving, we're seeing the worst surge, um, higher peaks, higher rates of positive cases, greater number of hospitalizations, and in the last two days, a record number of deaths across the United States. Um, I work at uh, UC San Francisco at our medical center, as you mentioned, Laura, and we have been carefully tracking the number of our positive cases among our healthcare staff and our other workers, and we're seeing unprecedented numbers in the last month um, widespread community transmission throughout California. The last time I checked, I think over 90% of California was in that purple tier. So we are at a very um, unique moment in the COVID pandemic. Um, we have to be all extremely attentive to um, remaining uh, where we can at that social distance, um, wearing our face coverings, um, all the layers of prevention, which we'll talk about later, that also applies to schools. Um, we also know that if we do that, we can flatten that curve and find a safer path to reopening schools. Our community rates are inextricably linked to reopening our schools. Um, that's reflected in the state of California public health guidance. Uh, you mentioned that there are the different colored tiers. Um, so we need to drive those tiers down across California from purple to yellow, which is the safest tier. And along the way, we can start seeing a roadmap to uh, safely reopening schools. Um, so uh, the other thing I would mention is that it's a very strange time because just at the moment when we're surging cases of COVID around the country. Just yesterday, we learned that the FDA has, uh, their advisory committee has recommended approving the vaccine. And in the coming days, the FDA will probably approve that vaccine for distribution with the first set of 
vaccine being distributed to our frontline healthcare workers and our vulnerable in nursing homes. So at the same time, when you're describing what sounds like a pretty awful circumstance for all of us, um, we have around the corner a, a highly effective vaccine. Um, so I just urge everybody to stick to it and hang on. Yeah, that's, um, that is a, a hopeful note. Um, well, you know, because as, as Chad said, so many people are getting tired. I know I'm tired. Um, you know, I feel, you know, sometimes it feels like there's a fatalism brewing. Um, but I know with my public health training that with really good preparedness and a well-run full court press that we can suppress this virus. Um, I know other countries have done better than we have. Um, share with us a few of the things that they have done on their public health infrastructure and their social safety net that's helped them really kind of stay ahead in, in, of things. There are really good models from other countries. Um, the, the lessons that we can take from other countries who've been successful in controlling COVID include a very widespread and easy access to free testing um, with very thorough, thorough and rapid contact tracing. So what contact tracing means is that if somebody is positive, then there's uh, an interview to find out who that person has come in contact with, notification of those other people who are then in quarantine for 14 days. Now that's been reduced lately in the last week to 10 days, but a quarantine. Um, and by doing so, and then providing the financial support so that individuals can safely isolate and they can protect their families and they don't have to fear losing their jobs or losing their paycheck. This kind of coordinated response um, has proven to be very successful in other countries. So I call it sort of the social and health fabric that wraps around and has that free, easy, accessible testing with contact tracing, the financial backup, um, for folks so they don't have to be afraid of coming forward to get a test. Um, if they're positive, there is that financial support for themselves and the protection of their families. Um, this has happened really successfully in countries like Australia, in South Korea, um, in Iceland, who did uh, massive testing very early on in the spring um, and have been able to reopen. Well, that's, that's encouraging um, as, as we kind of wrap up 2020 and move into the new year. Um, so let's turn a little bit to COVID-19 prevention within schools. So just as a little context, there are about 600,000 school employees in California who serve around 6 million public school students. In Oakland, we have three, 30, over 36,000 students and nearly 5,000 staff. Um, we know from some of the state's ed data that about 72% of students in Oakland Unified um, live in families who are in poverty and low income. Um, and we know that many of our students have family members who are at increased and elevated risk for severe disease for COVID-19. And so kind of what you just said, it seems you know, reasonable that no matter where a family lives, that they should be able to rest easy and rest assured that their neighborhood has low COVID-19 uh, uh, rates. And they should also be able to have confidence that their school, their child's school has a complete set of safety measures in place. So I wanna talk a little bit about that complete set of safety measures um, and to talk more about what our path is to safe teaching and learning during this pandemic. So a number of health experts, people have probably heard this in the news, um, have really recommended a layered defense against the virus. Um, from public health officials to university re researchers have been calling for this layered, uh, layered defense. The virologist Ian McKay calls it the Swiss cheese model to pandemic defense, thinking each layer has its holes, but when layered on top of each other, they reduce virus. Um, we had a, a CDC report that gave some encouraging news that said, while no single intervention can stop COVID-19 transmission, that a multi-layered approach of testing and mitigation measures proved successful in a case study that they did around um, a summer camp. 
and really uh, isolated cases early and was able to prevent transmission. So in this field of occupational and environmental health for a long time, um, tell us a little bit about what school families and school staff should be looking for in the school's prevention plan um, to you know, ensure that all of these layers are in place and, and what the path is to safely reopening um, schools. Well, thanks, Laura. I'm glad you brought up the food analogy. Um, I think of it as the chocolate cake defense, okay? You mentioned Swiss cheese. Um, I like Swiss cheese, but I confess, I do like chocolate cake better. Um, and I'm particularly fond of a seven layer chocolate cake. So when you talk about layers, I think of my fork at the end of the day where I'm you know, eating my chocolate cake to reward myself um, that I have to go through all those layers. Um, and I can't just pick out one layer because it doesn't taste as good. I got to eat it all. So it's a seven layer chocolate cake defense against COVID. The first and the overarching is that we have to control community transmission. So we have to get the community rates down low. Um, and this has been shown time and again in studies around the world, looking at the risk in schools. Um, because schools are a workplace, but they're also a community. And I work in occupational health. So I, I was used to thinking of, okay, a workplace, you know, a factory, um, an office building, well, the school is a workplace, but it also has a community inside of it. Namely, there are the children who then go home and live with families. So it's sort of, to me, like a triangle between the families, the, the, the children, and the staff and teachers in the school. And that is different for me in my thinking. Um, I think, Laura, you once told me that the schools touch 20 million people in California. So half of all Californians are in some way affected by schools. Um, so it's bigger than just the teachers. So first of all, um, that community transmission rates have to be driven down, they have to be low. Second, there needs to be a strong infrastructure that I mentioned for testing and tracing. So if there is going to be a case in a student or a teacher, which um, our studies and our experience thus far has told us will happen. Um, even if schools were open absolutely safe, safely with every measure in place, the chances are there are going to be um, outbreaks, there are going to be individuals who are positive. So testing and tracing, isolating, absolutely key. Um, second is we can't let down any of those layers, those defenses, if you will, those prevention layers. So masking, face coverings, keeping small and stable cohorts within the schools. Um, there's another aspect of testing, which I may talk about a little bit later. Um, you know, not only when there's a case, but ongoing testing to monitor um, the sanitation, the, the, the disinfection and the hand washing, um, having good ventilation, uh, which Teresa is gonna talk about later, and then effective training. Um, we have to protect those people who are at greater risk of disease. So the older individuals in our schools, those with other medical conditions that place them at high risk, if they should become infected. You know, it's great to have paper programs. It's based to have all these elements written down on paper, but having someone who's responsible to implement these programs, that's really where the rubber meets the road, is who's going to do it and who's responsible for implementation, having transparency. So if there's, there are cases that happen in a school among teachers or staff, making sure that there's a dashboard, there's a way for the community to track and see what's happening. Um, and then finally, um, I'm really glad that we now have a new OSHA standard. So the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Cal, Cal OSHA, as it's called here, um, just passed about 10 days ago, the first comprehensive worker protection standard in the country that has all of the layers that I just mentioned to you that are enforceable by OSHA. Oh, that's great. Another, another hopeful news. Um, so, you know, I'm a parent of a high schooler. I know you have young, young grandchildren. 
And many of our listeners are parents, caregivers, educators. And so children are at the heart and soul of our lives and what we do. So let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 and children. Um, what we do know is here in California and our state in each month since July, we've seen a larger percent increase in the cases among zero to 17 year olds than in other age groups that our state's health department um, uh, reports. Some California counties have had double digits of test positivity among children. And then unfortunately, California as a state doesn't report its test positivity data by age like some of the other states uh, do, um, which is too bad because you know we do, we have seen research that um, as test positivity gets elevated among young people, teens and young adults, that, that can you know, say that a hotspot might be on the horizon. But you know, lately we've been hearing, you know, I feel like every day we wake up in the news and there's a this study versus that study on COVID's impact on children and teens. And it can feel very confusing and destabilizing. Can you help us kind of cut through that noise and help us better understand um, if children under the age of 18 can get COVID, can transmit COVID, um, what are some of the health issues that we should be mindful of as parents, caregivers, and, and teachers? Mm -hmm. So first of all, children can get infected. We absolutely know that. Um, my grandson, my 18-month-old grandson toddler, um, became infected. Not clear whether he got it from his parents who are healthcare workers or he got it from his daycare. Um, fortunately, he was happy as a clam. He didn't know he was infected. Um, and that's pretty typical that children are less likely to have symptoms. So they are asymptomatic when they become infected. Um, little children are less likely to get infected than older children. So there's a, probably a spectrum between elementary school kids and high school kids in terms of their risk of both becoming infected and then also transmitting infection to the other children or to the staff and teachers in the school. Um, <clears throat> that's a, probably a combination of the biology in children. There probably is a less likelihood that the virus is gonna to attach to the receptor sites in their upper airways um, and then be able to replicate and cause infection and also behavior. Um, so high school, high schoolers are, as I say, more likely uh, closer in their behavior to college students. And since colleges, many about 1200 colleges and universities around the country reopened in the fall, um, some have had very, very aggressive testing programs. There's been over 300,000 college students infected. So we know, and, and that looks like it's driven by congregate, getting together behavior in colleges, often not in the classroom, but outside the classroom. And when I think about high school students, I think of what, what we would see in the classroom, but then the bell rings, they leave school um, and they're teenagers. They need to be, and they will be with other teenagers. Um, and so there's behavioral factors as well that differ between um, high schoolers and uh, elementary school kids. Um, we're, we're, we're still learning and studying um, the consequences of the virus for both children and adults. Um, in adults, there's increasing evidence that, that there can be for some very long recovery, what's called long COVID in the United Kingdom um, with longer term neurological and cardiac and lung effects. Um, in children, there's a small percentage that have um, a very severe inflammatory syndrome um, that for some kids puts them in the hospital. Fortunately, um, the fatality rate has been very, very low. Good news is that they, the children largely recover, but it can be quite serious. Um, so there is research data, but we're still lacking um, some really good answers about the risk of transmission in schools at the elementary and then middle school and high school levels um, that could be answered by a very robust testing program that's regular that could be combined with research. Um, so we would get those answers. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Well, so let's talk a little bit about testing. Um, you know, we've you know seen in the news around the groundbreaking school-centered COVID-19 testing program in San Diego Unified that's really been informed by some of your colleagues at UC San Diego. Um, we've seen what uh, Los Angeles has done. Um, here in Alameda County, the Office of uh, Education has signed an agreement with a private lab to provide testing for staff. Um, districts are on their own and responsible for kind of putting together their own plan and program. You know, and the state currently um, in its guidance document provides some examples of testing um, staff every two months with a, kind of a subset every, you know, percent every two weeks. Um, we've seen other health experts recommend a broader scope and broader and greater frequency. So at the Duke Margolis Health Policy Center, their report recommends testing all students and staff every two weeks and having, you know, some having that calibrated regarding as it relates to community transmission rates. Um, so there, there's a there's a lot happening and a lot that we hear again in, in various reports. Can you sh just talk with us a little bit uh, about testing? What are the, the types of COVID-19 tests? What are they used for? Um, more about frequency. And then this role of testing in both preventing transmission and slowing outbreaks and, and what we could learn from a school-centered testing program. So there are two um, types of COVID tests. One is the antibody test for past infection. <clears throat> so that's not useful for the question you just asked. So let's just put that aside. That just measures how much infection there has been. But what we wanna know is how much infection is there. And that's the viral test. <clears throat> and there are two There are two types of tests. <clears throat> there's the test for the virus itself. We call that the PCR test. And then there's a test for a protein that's produced by the virus and that's the antigen test. The good news is, is over the last 10 months, there have been a, an explosion of different types of tests. And what we know now is that the test that we had originally, which was the long swab that went up the nose that felt like a brain biopsy um, is accurate, but it's not necessary. The tests um, in the front of the nose or a saliva test or um, a test just swapped at the back of the throat is as accurate. Um, and they can be administered quickly. They can be self-administered, um, popped in an envelope and sent to a lab or shipped in, in, in batches for testing. So it's rapid, it's easy to do. Um, and we should have enough capacity um, in some places. I, I don't wanna say every place because of this surge. Um, we still need to reserve those tests for people who are sick and symptomatic. But if we get over this surge, then we should have enough capacity to do that rapid, rapid easy test. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a proponent of more frequent testing. So you mentioned the uh, various testing strategies. Um, I, I applaud um, those programs um, going into place. The virus takes anywhere from two to 12 days to incubate and cause infection. Um, so testing for monitoring, particularly to understand whether teachers are at risk if they come back to work I think should be done weekly. Um, and we can get some better answers by more frequent testing so that we're catching infection. Remember, 50% of people with COVID don't have symptoms. So if I'm testing every two weeks, I'm probably gonna be missing folks who got infected early and didn't know it. And I'm gonna miss a proportion. So weekly testing probably is about right for ongoing monitoring. And then once we see that there's no risk, we could probably back off to twice a week. So I'm a proponent, particularly in a purple county in a high risk community of weekly testing. Okay. So, you know, you started us with the uh, hopeful news about the vaccine. Um, we've seen in the proposals from federal decision makers as well as our state decision makers, kind of a proposal right now that would have uh, teachers and all school staff along um, with other essential workers right up after uh, healthcare workers and long-term care residents. 
Um, we've also seen reports from the COVID Collaborative and NAACP and Unidos US, um, where there is vaccine hesitancy among, in black and brown communities. And you know, it, we should really acknowledge that the history of racism in medical research, in our healthcare system, including things like the Tuskegee experiment um, are real and must not be minimized. And we know that our public health leaders are going to be doing more and more um, community health information for all of us and to give community members opportunities to ask their questions, to get those questions answered about both the vaccine, its safety, its effectiveness, and its development. Um, so I know more is going to be coming, but given that this was breaking news this week, if you could give us a preview of um, the vaccines, what we should expect here in California, and what, uh, yeah, just a little preview. So first of all, I think uh, I think it's happy day. I was very very excited when I read the study, um, the submission of the science. I reviewed it all. Um, there's a paper out to just today in the New England Journal of Medicine one of the most prestigious medical journals. So it's, it's, it's transparent, it's widely available for folks to, and scientists to read. Um, and it's a very highly effective vaccine. It's 95% effective um, with two shots and it's about 55% effective with one shot. Um, so I think that two shots are necessary for the most high level of effectiveness. There are some side effects um, and uh, it, it can be rough for just, you know, for a few percentage of people that take it. Um, everybody in the vaccine trial got better after a couple of days. Um, and uh, we don't know how long it's gonna work because the studies only came out after about two months after the trials. So to be determined um, whether we're gonna need a booster or another shot. <clears throat> um, and, uh, but it's, it's super highly effective. Um, uh, frontline workers, teachers and other workers um, according to the CDC's advisory committee um, are in the second tier or 1B as we call it. Um, the first shipments of the vaccine are gonna come out probably next week to frontline healthcare workers and nursing homes. Um, so I'm very excited actually personally because I'm a healthcare worker and I see all the folks who get uh, taken care of our, our um, patients at UC San Francisco that we're gonna start offering it to them next week. Um, I think, Laura, when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, um, you know, I, I would take the vaccine, but I think that that's not enough for me to clearly say that I would take it. I think we need to engage with teachers and communities of color um, and um, other populations with, with unique understandings and needs to, 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 to really, educate and inform and make sure people understand why it's important. Um, I personally think it's gonna be really important to get vaccinated. I, I think it's gonna be a way, if we can get 70 to 80% of our population to take the vaccine, um, that I can go and listen to music in September, which is my love when I'm not being a doctor. I wanna be able to go back out and listen to a concert. And I think the way that's gonna happen ultimately is for all of us, to feel a sense of community and get vaccinated. Well, that will be, it'll be a nice return and to have that extra kind of layer defense in our communities um, would, will be wonderful. So I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Harrison, for joining us today. Um, thank you for outlining all this important information. Um, I wanna bring now uh, Teresa Pistacchini into the conversation to talk about one of those important layers of the cake one of those important layers of, uh, in our layered Swiss cheese defense, and that is on uh, our clean air, the indoor air quality. So, you know, uh, to kind of a little set the context, so welcome, Teresa. Um, Hi, thank in you. In October, our federal CDC, um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, acknowledged that COVID-19 can be spread through airborne transmission. Um, the health agency cited research where people with COVID-19 infected others, you know, who were more than six feet away in an enclosed space with inadequate ventilation. Um, and, you know, science, air science researchers and air science physicists and HVAC experts have been, you know, sounding this alarm bell for, for many months. 
Um, so that was heartening news by the, the CDC to acknowledge that and begin to help institutions prepare um, to reduce this transmission. Um, here in our state, the California Department of Public Health um, has urged schools to intensify ventilation in their August industry guidance. And our own state public health officials recommend schools do things like, you know, increasing the amount of outdoor air and using a level of a filtration rating in our building um, that's at a, what they say is a MERV 13 level. And then to also consider portable HEPA filters um, to kind of augment that. But I'll tell you, when you mention HVAC, you mentioned ventilation, uh, we're all not engineers, and this can get really confusing and overwhelming real quick. So can you give us a basic primer on um, uh, what the basics of improving ventilation and filtration are? Um, and just kind of break that down for us in easy to understand terms um, for the indoor spaces we're in, and particularly for schools. Sure. So the... What happens is when we're breathing and talking, we admit <laughs> respiratory aerosols into the air and these particles become suspended in an indoor space. And then th this is why wearing face coverings is so important because it reduces the amount that enters into the air. Um, but even that can't make it zero, right? So what ends up happening is in our indoor spaces, we have these respiratory aerosols that build up inside the space and can remain airborne for potentially hours. And so the trick is to figure out how to get them out of the air. And so if we can just imagine that we've got, you know, lots of little glitter particles floating around and um, some of them may contain virus, how do we remove those from the air? So there are basically a couple of different ways. Um, I should mention that even without taking any action, eventually with enough time, the particles settle by gravity uh, to the floor or to surfaces. And so this is one reason why um, surface cleaning is also important, but I think is um, uh, that's not the only thing we need to do, right? So we've got these particles floating around and so how are we gonna get them out? We basically have two ways. So one is we can bring in fresh air from outdoors and that when you bring in fresh air from outdoors, you also exhaust room air outdoors. So you basically are changing out the air. And so new air comes in, mixes, and old air goes out. And so when you do that, um, you know, there's, there's no virus in your outdoor air, so it dilutes what's remaining inside. So that's one um, important way to remove particles from that may contain viruses in the air. Um, the second is through filtering. So Filter material can remove particles within the, the size range that we're concerned about um, if, if they meet certain standards. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But basically what you're doing is you're, you're taking a, a fan and pulling the air through a filter, cleaning it and returning it back to the room. And so if you um, cycle your air through a filter constantly, you remove a fraction of those particles every single time. And so then the effectiveness of that comes down to how much air you have in your room and how fast you're filtering it and how good your filter is. And so when we combine ventilation and filtration, we can make some predictions as to how much we'll reduce risk. Um, it will never be zero, right? But it can be reduced through these two, these two measures. And so, um, so there have been some efforts to to build airborne infectious disease transmission models and figure out, okay, you know, what are the appropriate combinations of ventilation and filtration that make it safer to operate a building? Um, schools are, are one of the trickier buildings because it gets, we, we, we have a lot of people in a pretty small space. Um, so that's where, that's why um, the, this is, is so important. And I think the other thing to recognize is that before the pandemic, um, there was very little focus on ventilation and filtration, um, something that I've been researching in, in schools prior to the pandemic. And generally the state of the art, the, the state of the situation prior to the pandemic is that in general, schools in California were poorly ventilated and had basic minimum filtration. 
So there's work to be done to get to the point where we're actually um, reducing the spread of, of airborne disease. Well, thanks. That that very much happens uh, or helps. So you you mentioned kind of this air filtration, and in the state guidance, it uses this word MERV 13. And so if you could tell us a little bit about what a MERV 13 filter is, why it's important. And we do hear, you know, I work uh, with um, uh, educators across the state. We've heard a number of districts uh, say, I, well, I can't, our system can't handle uh, MERV 13. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, what a MERV 13 is and what advice do you have in, in situations where educators may hear from um, school facility uh, the managers that the filtration of the MERV 13 is, is, won't work? Okay, so MERV stands for Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value, and it's a measurement of the filter's ability to remove particles within a certain size range. And that's a uh, accepted test standard that's published by um, the American Society of Heating and Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. Um, my point being is that it's it's a published test standard that and the results are generated by independent laboratories. So when we buy a filter with a MERV rating, we can have confidence that it's going to deliver that that specified performance. Um, so basically, as you increase in MERV rating, you are able to remove a larger fraction of particles um, in this size range that we're concerned about. And so I've got um, show and tell because that's always fun. So here is this is uh, from a school HVAC system. Um, <clears throat> so this is a MERV 8 filter and you can see it's two inches deep and it's pleated. And so basically as the air moves through here, right, it gets filtered. And so I've counted up the number of pleats on this filter here, right? You can see there's um, 24 pleats on this filter. And so that basically creates a surface area that the air moves through. And when it, when it moves through it, there's a pressure drop. And so the fan has to have enough power to move through this filter, right? And so when we increase in MERV rating, this filter media has more resistance. But if we look at a MERV 13 filter, which I have here, it looks basically identical, right? Same size, same two inches deep, same thing. Um, except if you count the number of pleats here, which I've done ahead of this, you get 35. So there's 50% more material in this filter. And what that actually does is because there's more surface area for the air to move through, even though the material has more resistance since there's more of it, there's more of it that actually creates a very similar pressure drop between the two filters, meaning that the air track system between these two sees very little difference. Um, it may not be no difference, but it's it's pretty negligible. Um, so uh, I think that that yes, there are HVAC systems that will will struggle to use a MERV 13 filter. Um, I showed you some two inch filters. Uh, sometimes you only have a one inch slot, and then options are even more limited. But basically, what districts need to do is they need to uh, when they're purchasing filters, they they need to ask for pressure drop data associated with the different filter models they're considering. And then from there, you can choose a lower pressure drop option uh, because not all, some have more pleats than others, which will give you a better result. Um, and then from there, you can actually just test your, you can test filters um, inside your different HVAC systems, uh, test and air balance contractors that are certified can come measure air flows, uh, with different filter configurations. So I and think, th yeah, just in ahead. summary, I think there are systems that it will be very difficult or impossible to use MERV 13 filters, but I think that that fraction is, is less than that initial reaction is that, oh, we can't do that, right? Um, I think most of the time you can. And where, what is the role of uh, the portable HEPA filters or HEPA air cleaners? Where, where does that come into the picture? Okay, so um, a portable HEPA filter will remove um, an even higher efficiency, uh, will remove a, a greater fraction of particles than a MERV 13 filter will, but generally the airflow rates are lower. So 
in combination, if you're running a central system with a main filter and then you add a HEPA cleaner, you'll do even better. And so basically when you're buying portable air cleaners, you wanna look at the clean air delivery rate, um, which, and you want, ideally you want that to be tested to a standard. Um, AHAM is the primary standard for rating these sort of smaller residential scale portable air cleaners. And so from there, if you combine central filtration with portable air cleaning, um, that's a really good strategy. Let's say, for example, I have a classroom where um, it's determined I can't use a MERV 13 filter or um, I, I'd rather just use a portable air cleaner instead, for example, um, based on a, on a, a model I ran um, from the California Department of Public Health. If you have a portable air cleaner with uh, 450 uh, cubic feet per minute of clean air delivery, that's equivalent essentially to having a central MERV-13 filter, if both classrooms are also ventilated, by the way. <laughs> so there are different ways to achieve equivalent results with filtration. There are different strategies you can, you can take to get there. Well, that's super helpful. And, and again, another hopeful note that there, there are paths to getting um, good ventilation and good air filtration inside our classrooms. And I know you've you know, done a lot of research actually in school buildings, looking at HVAC systems and studying them. Um, and you know, you've mentioned the importance of CO2 uh, sensors. Can you talk a little bit about what a CO2 sensor in a classroom does? and why it's helpful to ensure good indoor air quality. Sure, let me first mention in a study we did in 104 classrooms across California, we measured ventilation rates in those classrooms and we also surveyed teachers and we asked for their perception on indoor air quality. And there was no correlation between actual ventilation rates and teachers' perceptions. Um, so, the issue is that many people are working, teaching, living inside buildings with inadequate ventilation and have no idea. You don't, you know, when you're cold, you know you're cold, right? When you're in a poorly ventilated building, you can't, you just can't walk in and know, right? So it's very, very difficult. So what a CO2 sensor does is it tells us the information right, right away, basically. Um, so outdoor, so CO2, we all exhale CO2 into our environment. And when we're inside, it builds up just like those respiratory, respiratory aerosols build up. And if a building is well ventilated, so out, outdoor CO2 concentration, CO2 is just naturally incurring in the environment, right? It's not dangerous um, at typical concentrations, but uh, so carbon dioxide is in the environment at about 400 parts per million. If a building is well ventilated, we should have indoor carbon dioxide concentrations at um, uh, below 1,000 parts per million. So if we have a CO2 sensor, um, that's a really quick visual indicator when our classroom is full of kids to be able to go look at that and say, yep, everything's working, because otherwise, how would we know? Um, and also, additional show and tell. So like, here's an example. I was going to see if we can show that. Um, but so here's a here's a wall mounted uh, thermostat that includes a CO2 sensor in it. You can see down here below right now in my office, it's reading about 664 parts per million. Um, and so that just gives us a way and there's all different manufacturers and brands and, you know, doesn't really matter. Um, but I do really like models that include a display for the teacher so that occupants have uh, some awareness. I will mention that I've heard cases of facility managers going through empty buildings and not finding CO2. Well, which makes sense because nobody's in there. Um, so <laughs> CO2 monitors are only, their readings are only useful when your space is, is being occupied, right? So you would, you would, in order to know if your building's well ventilated, using a CO2 sensor, you have to have people in there. Mm -hmm. So it will give you a sense during the day if there's that fluctuation once you've been in there for, you have a group of people for an amount of time. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. I'll also well, add that um, for classrooms that may not have sufficient, when I, when I talk about outdoor air, the question is how does that outdoor air get into your classroom? 
Many classrooms have mechanical ventilation systems, basically fans and outdoor air openings that can bring that fresh air in. Um, but then there's the case of what if they're not adequate or what if they don't exist at all, which is possible and we're relying on, on doors and windows. Um, so one thing, if you have a CO2 sensor, a teacher, um, although it requires a little bit of effort, um, can, can, can then have a, a basis to figure out like, okay, do I have enough windows open? Do I, how, how, how well is this working? Um, whereas without a sensor, I mean, you would just have no idea. Yeah, it sounds like really practical in real time kind of information to help, you know, change the situation. You know, and, and so one of, you know, one of the things we know is like good from a lot of research um, is that good indoor air quality also really impacts learning and that, you know, good air helps uh, people learn better. So the, you know, the, this information that you're sharing with us now is not only important as we try to reduce risk for infectious uh, particles during this pandemic, but, it, you know, really for as we go forward um, post pandemic, for a, a, you know, a really good, healthy, strong learning environment. And I know, you know the materials that you and your team at UC Davis have put together um, are super easy to use, user-friendly. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the tools that parents and school staff um, can access you know, after, after this webinar? Sure, let me just share my screen and I'll take you over to our website briefly. that again. Okay, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so this is our homepage, um, wcec.ucdavis.edu. If you go to research and scroll down here, there's a page on indoor air quality in California schools. I really recommend this six minute video here. It goes over the overall benefits of ventilation and filtration. Um, not specifically related to COVID-19, but just in general, there are uh, really significant impacts um, to student performance and absence rates um, improve with increased ventilation. And I also cover here um, the four steps that um, I talked a little bit about um, in this conversation. And if you really wanna get into the nitty gritty details I think that one of the, we've got a bunch of resources here on the topic, um, and uh, one of my favorite here is uh, at the very end, a California Department of Public Health resource on um, the role of ventilation and filtration in reducing risk of transmission in schools. Um, but yeah, so there's all kinds of, all kinds of things you can, you can take a look at here, and uh, hopefully that helps. Oh, that stuff is great. I just encourage everyone to really check out those materials and a real big thanks to you and to your team for putting them together and helping all of us really get an understanding of this important topic. Um, so thanks so much for being here today with us, Teresa. Um, we really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge and experience with us. So thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now bring into the conversation um, Alexia Maciela, um, who is a parent at um, uh, in Oakland Unified at La Escuelita School. So, uh, hi Alexia, how are you? Hi, how you been? Great, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, welcome. Um, so glad you're here with us today. So, you know, we've been in this pandemic for nine months. Um, how are you and your family doing? And what are you thinking right now about school reopening? Uh, well, answering your first question, my, my family, we're doing okay. None of us have been positive to the COVID. We have been in the house most, most of the times, only grocery shopping and coming back. And my son doesn't go outside. He doesn't want to go outside for nothing at all. Um, for me, going back to school right now, to be honest, I don't feel safe. Like my son suffers from asthma. I have diabetes and asthma. My husband has asthma. So it's kind of difficult for us to put our son outside in the school, but we're not, um, how can I say this? It doesn't sound in a mean way. Like we're gonna send our kids to our school, but doesn't give us the guarantee that they're gonna be 100% that they're not gonna get infected. So we here, we stay safe, we clean everything, we sanitize everything, we go out, 
we leave our shoes um, downstairs, we take a shower, wash our hands, everything. So if, like, if you go to the school, the kids in our school, Las Colita has 34 kids in the classroom. So when they told us um, they're not gonna com come back all together at the same time, one in the morning, another group in the afternoon, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, another Tuesdays and Tuesdays and Fridays. So it was like kind of like difficult that plan they were having. So for me, in, 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 to be honest, I don't, I don't agree to go back to school. I understand school is uh, the first thing parents want for our kids to like, be successful. But right now, I'm, every time they send me the, the, the to fill out the you know the inquest, that's how you say. It. Uh, will you agree to send your kid full time, part time, or be in distance learning a hundred percent? I always say distance learning a hundred percent. Why? Because even right now with the vaccine being out that even today my my oldest daughter that who's in college she asked me what do you think about the vaccine can we take it or not take it and i told my daughter to be honest right now i know the first people are going to be uh first responders doctors nurses all those people but i mean we don't know how you're going to react to the to the vaccine we don't know what size effects you're going to have every time in my family we put the flu shot every year every year so if it's gonna be this for us every year to put the vaccine, yeah, we'll, we'll be okay to, uh, to go on and, and put it up. But at the same time, right now, we don't know the side effects of everything. I have my son, he's autistic. So I don't want, um, I, I hear so many things about vaccination. I'm not against that. I understand you have to put, uh, the you, you have to vaccinate yourself and all those things, but I'm like 50-50. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know if it's gonna be 100% uh, uh, secure. I don't know what side effects it's gonna have. So right now I just told my, da my daughters and it was, I was talking to my husband last night. We just have to wait. Like let's, I mean, not to be mean, but I mean, we'll see what happens to the first people that are gonna get vaccinated. And after that, if everything is okay, then yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be 100% uh, positive on the vaccination. But Yesterday we were talking to the principal. Uh, sorry, my bad. On on Tuesday we were talking to the principal on the SSC about what do we think? And maybe supposedly, but it's the hundred percent sure. January twenty fifth, we're coming back, but we don't know. That's what they send on the flyer and all those things. And I said the same thing. If there's no there's no hundred percent secure for our kids to be in the school, my child is not going back to the school right now. I mean, I prefer. I know it's the same thing learning in the house than learning in the school. But right now it's not it's not safe. The schools are not safe for our kids. Kids don't wash their hands, even adults, to be honest. Sometimes we forget to wash our hands. They say don't cross come and contaminate. Don't grab your phone if you're in the stores. Don't do this. You forget those things. So in my head, I'm I'm thinking we don't listen sometimes. Adults, we don't listen or we forget. So imagine that uh first a grader, second grader, even my son who's an eighth grader, sometimes he, he forgets to do something, but no, I, I'm, I'm not against, and at the same time, like I told the teachers, I understand some parents are pushing the schools to open. We need to open, we need to, but at the same time, we're forgetting teachers are people too. They have families, they have kids, they have parents, they have issues with their health. So I'm like, I, I'm, I'm not against going back, but I, I wanna be, secure that my kids gonna be okay and the teachers are gonna be okay that's my first yeah. thing i always say if teachers are okay our kids are okay mm -hmm. so let's talk you know let's talk about uh, that because i think you know we are seeing this dynamic in you know across our country in our state and our school district you know and the district did um you know a, a survey and we see, have seen some preliminary results that show that about 30 you know 33 percent of black and Latino families plan to send their children to in-person, um, you know, if it was available. But in a much higher percentage of white families, just over half, about 55%, said they would send their kids. Um, in New York City, we saw a similar pattern um, with their actual enrollment, where there are, are about 12,000 more white children um, returning to public schools in New York City than black students, even though black students in the city's public schools, um, there's more overall. And Asian families also in New York City, um, you know, disproportionately chose remote learning. 
you know, and that's been consistent with a lot of national polls, some recent ones that just came out from researchers at big universities like Northwestern and Northeastern and Harvard. Um, and even in June, we saw um, a poll from the University of Michigan that polled families like from, you know, the area that, that I'm from in the, in the Midwest um, that show that families, low income families, were less likely than higher income um, families to report their, that they were planning to send their children back to school. Um, so we, we've kind of seen kind of this, this debate, you know, kind of uh, happen. And so in thinking about what is it, what are the guarantees and assurances that all of us as parents need to see in the community with our public health programs, and in our schools, with our school safety programs, um, to uh, you know, give us some assurances that our children will be safe in in-person learning, and so will the adults who work with them. So, what are your thoughts when you think about you know your family and the families that you represent on the SSC? What do you what do you think? What what do you think, and you want to see in those plans? And one of the on um, one of the meetings that they were talking about going back, and they were guaranteeing given guarantee to us that everything was gonna be fine. They will have sanitizers, they will have lights, so they will have all, the, all these things. In my head, the first thing that came like, if you give me 100% sure you're gonna have all those things, maybe, maybe I will send my son. But I'm pretty sure you're not gonna, you're not gonna have those things. Why? To be honest, we live in, I live in Oakland. In Oakland, public schools are not like 100% like, you know, funded. So. I told the, the principal, sometimes we, the parents, have to take toilet paper. Sometimes we have to uh, take some hand sanitizer. Please, can you bring on this month uh, some photos webs to clean the tables? So it, it's difficult for a parent to believe right now that like you're going to have everything that you're saying, everything is going to be on the checklist, and you're going to have it each day, every day. So the parents, so we, were, we were having some meetings. And let's say from 100%, 40% uh, of the parents want to send their kids. Some of them because they have to go back to work and they don't have a place. Um, they rely on school from A to five or A to three. Other parents because they're bored having their kids in the house. Like I'm tired, I don't know what to do with them. And any of every opinion is fine. I, I respect everybody, whatever they, their opinion is. Other parents said, no, I don't wanna send my kids. Why? Because it's not safe. My parents live with me, they're old, so they can take care of my kids, I can go back to work. Some of the parents said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't have nobody to take care of my kids, but I'll hire somebody, a neighbor, a friend, somebody. So in school, we were asking like, how many children are we gonna have in the, in the classroom? What happens in recess? What happens in the cafeteria? How many people? Then they start saying, volunteers, we're not gonna have volunteers in school. Why? Because we have to be more like, not, not having too much people. But then there was another issue with that. Like we have a bunch of volunteers in, in La Escuelita that help in recess, lunch, and in between classes because teachers have too much in their hands. So some they say, oh, the teacher's gonna take care of the, of the student when he gets out of the cafeteria. No, because the teacher needs to eat. So those are the things that we were trying to say, see, you're going from one thing to another that we already know the answer. Like. At what time the teacher is going to eat? That teacher needs to eat, go to the restroom, make some phone calls, make copies. In those things, volunteers, we used to do those things. I have been volunteering for um, nine years in La Escuelita since my son was in kindergarten. Right now he's in egg grade. So for me, for me to hear those things from, from everybody, he was like, no, it's, I, I don't want to be mean, but I know it's not 100% guarantee all those things you're telling me. Why? Because the teacher needs to eat, go to the restroom, make copies for the homework, uh, make the packages of the homework. So uh, at what time they're gonna have all those things and the kids are in the cafeteria, they're gonna be talking to each other or how far away you're gonna have now, like how they're gonna eat. So all those things came and some of the parents were like, oh, you know what, we didn't think about those things. We were like, oh, okay, they're gonna take care of them. Everything's gonna be fine. We pick them up at three and we're done. No, that's, that's, that's not true. So, and I, I always tell the, the principal, whoever is in the meeting, don't take me wrong. I respect your job. I, I know I'm just a normal person and you know more than me because you're a teacher or you're, but at the same time, I'm the parent of one kid. 
So I'm not always working for my son only. I'm working for 465 children you have in La Escuelita. So I have to think like all those kids are my children. And if you're going to tell me to tell the parents, oh, go back to La Escuelita, everything's going to be 100% okay. That's not true. Because we don't have everything ready for our kids to go back to La Escuelita. Even we don't have it, um, people who clean the schools before. We, we were like trying to find people to clean our schools. Right now they're telling us, oh, we're going to have a bunch of help in La Escuelita. And in our true. Why? Because people, even people, workers don't want to come back right now. Why? Because they're afraid. And we have to respect those things. Like they don't, they don't, they don't feel secure going back to um, going to uh, to work to the, to the schools. Why? Because some kids, their parents take care of themselves when they go out. Some other kids, they don't. Uh, some other parents, sorry, they go out and they don't put a mask. They don't wash their hands. They're, and those are the those are the things that are making everything more difficult. I understand Latinos, we're kind of people like we're stubborn. And I can say, I can say we're stubborn because we don't listen until it happens to us. Until, oh, now I believe it. Oh, that's real. I have seen this in, in, our, in my community. They still make parties, go out. And sometimes you tell them, don't do those things because you're making this, one person can help imagine 10, 20, 40, 50. So my parents, they say that, Let's say from 100%, 40%, they want to go back for a bunch of reasons. The other percent, they say, no, we're not going back. Why? Because I pref even one mom told me, I prefer my son to repeat the same grade next year by having him healthy. I mean, I prefer that than send my kid to school. And let's say one month later, I have my kid in the hospital. So if you put it in that, in that area, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm not against what the plans of the school has, but I mean, they're not 100% secure. Well, it, you know, listening to you, it's like, you know, after so many years of volunteering in the schools, you know the practical realities of uh, the funding, the staffing, kind of what's available and what's not. And it, you know, made me think of like what Dr. Harrison started us with that, you know, there's a written plan and then it actually has to like get put into place and somebody's mm -hmm. got to maintain it. And that takes resources, money, time, people. Um, so, you know, I, your perspective on just like the practical realities, I think is incredibly valuable. And it's important for us to, you know, all remember in this moment of, you know, we're trying to get through this pandemic together and what's it gonna take? Um, and, you know, as you've mentioned, our schools have been underfunded for decades um, in Oakland and across California. Um, we have some of the lowest per pupil funding um, in our state um, than any state in the country. We're, we're really not at the top tier where we wanna be. So, you know, in this pandemic, we're really facing that. You've seen what that's meant as a parent around what resources are available or not available in your school. Um, uh, anything you wanna kind of share with others, you know, as a leader in your school on the SSC, any, any other, you know, final message you wanna, um, you know, give to folks today who are, are viewing this webinar? The, the only thing I can say, like, if we're going back to school, if we're, we're sending our kids back to school, just give us 100% the guarantee that they're gonna be safe. Like in the organization plan, they always told us uh, science goes first. Why? Because the doctors know better even of the teachers. The doctors know if it's really, uh, when I go to Kaiser and for any appointment, I ask the doctors, 100% secure the, the, the vaccine. And they give me too much information. So the only thing I can say, if uh, the only I want for my son or for the other kids is if they're going back to the school, be honest to the parents, like, oh, everything's gonna be fine. Take the vaccine, the vaccine is gonna be fine. And we have a really good plan and we'll, we'll see them here. If it's not this year, maybe next year, whenever the time is, but that's only, the only thing we're asking is for teachers um, the district and the doctors, to be honest, and we always believe first the doctors. On this area right now, plan says uh, science knows better than everything right now. So, I mean, we only hope for the best for everybody and hopefully uh, this can go away soon. And if we work together, it will. Like if, if we make, uh, I don't know, if make more like conscious to put our mask and not be doing too much parties and all those things, we can work this out like other people are doing it. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, I think a big thank you from our entire community for all the volunteer service that you've provided to uh, our students and to our school. So thanks so much. Um, it's great to, to have had uh, this chance to talk to you today. So take care. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so I want to now turn the program over to Oakland Education Association President Keith Brown to close us out. Thank you, Laura. Um, thank you for moderating a um, very informative panel today. And also I wanna thank all of our uh, panelists today. Um, this has been um, very informative for um, our community here in Oakland. And this December, we're experiencing some of the most deadliest days in US history but I do feel that we have a light at the end of the tunnel, but we cannot let our guard down at this time prematurely. It is important for everyone to wear a mask, stay at home as much as you can, whenever you can, and with only the members of your household and give you know, respectful physical distance from others. So it's very important that we all um, take the necessary safety precautions. And also during this time, for those of you who can to support those in need, participating in mutual aid. Um, also, you could go to tinyurl.com slash OEA toy drive 2020 by Friday, December 18th to support no to low income families in need this holiday by purchasing gifts such as toys, warm coats, clothing. So please consider supporting the OEA toy drive. Oakland educators, our number one priority is the safety of our students our colleagues, families, and communities. We look forward to working with the community and the district to advocate and make free regular COVID-19 surveillance um, testing for students available here in Oakland and across the state. And just as we heard today, we call for investments in public health and strong measures to achieve and maintain health equity with low community COVID-19 rates in all zip codes across the city of Oakland. Happy holidays, be well, and be safe. Thank you.